I'm here to tell you a story, a story about a really bad day 66 million years ago, and how the creativity of the scientific process allowed geologists to tell that story. Now, we usually don't think of the scientific method as something that's particularly creative. In fact, the regimented step-by-step -step approach of experimentation, hypothesis, observation, modification of hypothesis, all of that can seem quite stifling. But that picture of science that we learn in our science classes is not always an accurate representation of how science works. And many of our most groundbreaking and influential scientific discoveries involve more. Let me give you an example. Benzene is an organic compound that makes up a significant component of crude oil. I've indicated the structure up here. That structure was discovered in 1890 by Frederick Auguste Kakule. He credits the discovery to a series of dreams he had where he envisioned atoms dancing around, eventually joining together like a snake eating its tail. That story, of course, has been questioned. Perhaps because we don't like to think of science as anything more than the objective application of the scientific method. But I want to argue that science is more. I'll come back to that. Now for our story. To tell that story, we need to do as a geologist does and go back in time. Let me introduce the geologic time scale. This is the framework that geologists and paleontologists use to tell where we are in the 4.65 billion years of Earth's history. This time scale has been 200 years in the making and is based on fossil and rock sequences from around the world. To read this, we start in the bottom right when the Earth forms in the Precambrian era. Then we move all the way to the top left where we end today in the Cenozoic. For this talk, or for this, you know, story, we need to focus on the Cretaceous period. That bad day I mentioned occurs at the end of the Cretaceous and marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Let's take a look at what happened. 66 million years ago, an asteroid hits the Earth at 40,000 miles per hour. That asteroid was six miles in diameter and hit the Earth at present-day Yucatan Peninsula near the town of Chuxalub, Mexico. Our record of that impact can be found in what is called the Chuxalub Impact Crater, a 115-mile crater outside of Chuxalub, Mexico. We can also find the fallout of the event in sediments that formed around the globe. Perhaps most notable among these is something called the Iridium Anomaly. Iridium is an element that is rare on Earth, but is actually quite common in extraterrestrial material. In sediments that mark the end of the Cretaceous, we see a peak in the concentration of iridium. Here I am in this photo holding a core of rock or a section of rock that records that boundary. See the white layer there represents the seconds, minutes, and hours following the impact. The fact that we can get such a detailed record of time from 66 million years ago is absolutely amazing and why I love geology. That blue layer there is the iridium anomaly. Now this asteroid impact is important because as I said, it sets in motion a series of events that causes the extinction of the dinosaurs. First among these events is widespread wildfires. As the asteroid comes hurtling into the Earth, it heats the, the air around it. This superheated air causes the ignition of any vegetation in the surrounding areas. Those wildfires spread and kill off large portions of the terrestrial plants. Those are food sources for our herbivorous dinosaurs. And eventually marks the initiation of ecosystem stresses that lead to their extinction. The asteroid would have also triggered an earthquake and a tsunami. We're talking wave heights anywhere from 10 to 1,000 feet high. This tsunami would have devastated coastal ecosystems, and it left its mark on the sedimentary rocks that formed in those settings. The asteroid would have also impacted the Earth's climate. On short time scales, the injection of dust, soot, and sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere would have led to what is called an impact winter.
or think a nuclear winter. The sun's rays are blocked out and the earth cools. Photosynthesis is further inhibited. This only lasts for about tens to hundreds of years. It would have also impacted the climate, though, on longer time scales. Initially, we get cooling, but then, because of the widespread wildfires and the rocks that were actually struck by the asteroid would have released carbon as well, we would have seen an increase in atmospheric CO2 levels. This injection of CO2 would have led to warming that was lasting anywhere from tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Now, two years ago, this was just a prediction, and we didn't have any good empirical evidence indicating that there was warming following the impact. The reason for this lack of empirical evidence is that the go-to methods that we use for modeling temperature change in the Cretaceous didn't work for the end Cretaceous. To explain why, I need to talk about what climate is and how geologists study the climate of the past. Climate can be defined by a couple of different variables. Things like temperature, ice volume or the amount of ice, the atmospheric composition. All of those things today are relatively easy to measure. I can go out around the globe, different locations, and measure temperature over 30 years and calculate an average global temperature. I can take samples of the atmosphere and I can me measure the relative proportions of things like CO2 and methane. Importantly, all of these techniques are measuring the thing at the time. But as you can imagine, it's really hard to measure the atmosphere from, say, 44 million years ago, or in our case, 66 million years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. It's changed. So we have to be very creative as geologists in finding ways to measure these or estimate these important variables without the actual thing there. Now, one of the ways that we do this was established in the 60s and 70s, um, and it's based on this idea that the chemistry of the rocks and fossils that are forming at the time will reflect those variables because they're a part of their environment. Broadly speaking, this technique is called stable isotope geochemistry, and I know it sounds scary. But fundamentally, it's based off the idea that isotopes, or atoms of the same element with a different number of neutrons, will behave differently. Those behavioral differences are due to their differences in mass and therefore energy levels. So for example, we could look at carbon. Carbon has two stable isotopes. There's carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons. Or we could look at carbon-13, which has six protons and seven neutrons. Carbon-13 has a slightly higher mass. It is slightly heavier. It is slightly harder to work with. You need more energy to get it going. Carbon-12, easier to work with, more reactive. So plants, they tend to like to take carbon-12 in and carbon-12 tends to be enriched in that organic matter that's produced, or the plant material. Oxygen isotopes are just as useful, and we've been able to establish a relationship in the laboratory, empirically relating temperature to oxygen isotopes. We can, just, we can model this relationship in this figure here. Now, this looks very complicated, but let me explain. The idea is that water has oxygen isotopes in it, it's H2O. It has oxygen 16 and it has oxygen 18. When animals build their skeletons or they build their shells, they pick one isotope over another depending on the temperature the water is. So that if we were to measure the oxygen isotopic composition of a fossil through time, we could te technically get a record of temperature change through time. It's a very powerful tool. Now, there's a lot more going on there, but that's really the gist of how it works. So, if this was established in the 60s and 70s, why do we not have good temperature estimates showing warming following the Cretaceous impact? Well, we were stuck sticking to what we were used to using, and traditionally in the Cretaceous, these kind of geochemical records are based on these things. They're quite pretty. They're foraminifera. They're single-celled organisms, or protista, that live in the oceans today and in the Cretaceous. These shells are microscopic and might make up a significant portion of beach sand in some locations. When they build their skeletons, they do it in such a way that reflects the chemistry and the temperature of the environments in which they live. 
The problem for the end Cretaceous, though, is that many of these go extinct, disappear, or are poorly preserved. So we couldn't get temperature following the impact. We needed something else to measure these things on. And that's where fish come in. My co-authors and I approached this problem by looking for a fossil that we knew spanned the impact so that we could get temperature before the Cretaceous impact and temperatures after the Cretaceous impact and test for warming. So to get fish fossils, we need rocks. Yes, rocks are exciting. Um, so my co-authors went to Tunisia, Africa, to something called the El Kef section. Now I know this is not very glamorous. In fact, they had to dig a trench to get the stuff off the top. But this section is amazing because it has a detailed record of time before and after the impact. From those rocks, we were able to isolate fish fossils. These are microscopic fish fossil, fossils, things like teeth and scales, all of which are going to record the chemistry and the temperature of the water in which they're living. So from those fossils, we were able to generate this data set. Okay? On the horizontal axis, or the x-axis, what we see is oxygen isotopes. But remember, those are just standing in for temperature. So we've indicated temperature on the top, where warmer is that way and cooler is this way. On the y, or the vertical axis, that's time. Now we measured a sedimentary thickness here, and we have to calculate time out of that, but essentially time. So the question is, what happens following that impact? Well, oxygen isotopic values decrease, which indicates warming right at the impact. And then for what we calculate to be about 100,000 years following that impact. So what do we have? Well, we had a hypothesis that there'd be temperatures increasing following the Cretaceous impact. We have results from our study which show that oxygen isotopic values decrease following that impact. We have an interpretation that temperatures warmed about 5 degrees Celsius and stayed warm for about 100,000 years after that impact. Now, I started this talk by saying that science was more than just the scientific method. But I just gave you a beautiful example of a scientific method working perfectly in its simplest form. We had a hypothesis, we tested that hypothesis, and the results are consistent with that hypothesis. But, as I indicated, there's a lot of stuff that goes on ahead of time before we get to those hypotheses. And there's a lot of hard work and creativity in between. And then really what happens after, what we do with these types of results, all of that involves hard work and creativity of the scientists involved. For example, these types of studies are actually quite helpful in understanding the magnitude of future climate change and how we respond to climate change. For example, one of the things we're interested in is how much the Earth's global temperature will actually rise because of CO2 injection. This relationship can be modeled here, where we have different temperatures depending on how much CO2 is added, and then we have different impacts associated with them. So whether or not we lose one-third of the coastal ecosystems depends on whether or not we reach 3.5 uh, degrees C above pre-industrial levels. These have huge implications for how we respond in the future. There's a lot of uncertainty in those data sets, though. As you can see, the error bars of the gray and the white. Studies like ours are going to help us refine that uncertainty and better prepare us for the future. I think climatologist James Hansen says it best, and I'll paraphrase here. Models themselves, climate models that is, can't solve this on their own. We need the geologic record as our empirical test for how the Earth's climate system works. So these have become an important part of that endeavor in understanding the magnitude of future climate change. I want to leave you with this idea. Yes, science does involve the scientific method. But in between those, there's a lot of stuff going on. How we formulate our hypothesis, how we set up an experiment, how we decide how to figure out how to measure things like CO2 or temperature 444 million years ago, how we present our results and how we communicate those results to the public. All of those things involve creativity of a science, scientist involved. And it's that stuff that I think makes science fun. It's why I do it. And so if I'm thinking about the future of creativity, what I would say is that part of it is 
recognizing and embracing science for the creative process that it is. Thank you. <laughs>